Welcome to Costume Confidential, a sneak peek at the backstage of the Pickering Museum's costume collection. I'm Julie Oakes, I'm the costumer of the Pickering Museum Village, and uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about fashion in the 1830s. We do a play every year called A Spirit Walk, and it's about the rebellion of 1837, so we thought we'd get into that a little bit. So, what kind of clothing might have been worn by men in 1837? Well, if you were a gentleman, like for example, John Beverly Robinson, the judge, you might be wearing an outfit like this. Now, you can observe a fine burgundy frock coat, and by the way, people that think Victorians and people in the, in the 19th century wore only black are sadly mistaken. That's unfortunately because the pho photography was black and white, but they did really enjoy color. And as you can see, this frock coat is a beautiful dark burgundy, and it's, uh, it's double-breasted. And underneath, take a look at the color on this waistcoat. This is absolutely spectacular. Beautiful golds, burgundies, greens, tans. That's very, that's very typical of the time period. Underneath that, he would have simply worn trousers, and these trousers are of um, uh, just, a, uh, just a fine cotton. He probably would have worn wool as well. And uh, they are a broad fall, which is a, a, a type of trouser that, that, that buttoned over the front uh, in, in the fly area. Now, if you were a farmer who was marching to rebel, you would not be wearing something as fancy as that. So, for the farmer, I'm just going to give you a, a little look at these broad fall pants so you have an idea what I was talking about, about the fly. You see how the button goes right across the front here and then the whole flap comes down in the front. So this is made of a sturdy cotton drill, very useful for farming. That would have been the under, the under layer for the farmer. And then you can see he has a very plain shirt. Please note that the uh, drop shoulder with a very, um, the sleeve has gussets at the bottom for maximum um, um, ease of movement, I guess, if you're farming. And uh, it's just very simply, um, just one button at the collar. He probably would have worn some type of a neckerchief uh, to be able to wipe his brow or to be able to, uh, you know, catch the sweat. And then over top of that, always a waistcoat. People have this idea that farmers didn't wear waistcoats, but they certainly did. A man wasn't considered dressed unless he had a waistcoat on. So this one's a very simple one. It's actually made of a, a cotton corduroy, which is a typical fabric of the time. The back is, a, is like a cotton sateen. It might have been wool. Um, and then, then with this, he would have, of course, been wearing outerwear because the rebellion happened in December of 1837. And as you can see from the picture, uh, this is the uh, C.W. Jeffries print, uh, March of the Rebels. And uh, you can see a, a quite a big variety of headgear on the gentleman in that picture. And so, although our, our judge might be wearing a beautiful topper like this, made of uh, beaver felt or pressed wool, uh, your farmer type would most likely be wearing something a little less fancy. This is a, a low-crowned uh, hat. He might have had a top hat, but it probably wouldn't have been as beautiful as, as the judge's. He might also have been wearing something along the lines of um, a wool uh, cap to keep his head warm. Um, something like that as well would have been suitable. Uh, he might have been wearing a coonskin cap. In that, in that photograph, there is someone wearing a coonskin cap. Um, very practical. And he might have just been wearing a hat that his wife knitted for him. Certainly, if they were marching off to rebel, they knew that it was going to take them a while to get to Toronto, they would have been wrapped up in, in uh, scarves, hats. They certainly would have had gloves on. Um, possibly, they might have been wearing gaiters on their, uh, on their trousers. Gaiters are um, a covering that you put over your calf, and it's buttoned up the side. And this is to prevent mud and thorns and, and burrs from getting onto your trousers. So they most likely would have been wearing something like that. So that's a sort of a little bit of a look at what gentlemen might have been wearing during the rebellion. Um, now, what were their wives wearing? Well, uh, again, this is, a, this is a typical 1830s dress. You can see it has a slightly higher waist line, like it's not as high as the empire waist of the Regency time, but it does have the typical puff sleeves of the time, of the time period, beautiful puff sleeves. These would have been kept up puffed like this with either little pads inside, sometimes made of, uh, of tulle or sometimes made of swans down, or they might have had uh, you know, a, a series of tapes holding them upwards. But anyway, they always ended up with a fairly narrow wrist. And then very often there were tucks across the bottom. 
uh, you can't really see the tucks here. There, there's the tucks along the bottom, and that just is, and a little bit of extra decor. This one happens to be decorated with a little bit of fine cotton lace, which is typical. Now, this would have been considered a sort of a best dress for a farmer, a farmer's wife. Uh, more, more likely her everyday wear would have been certainly a lot plainer than this. And you know, it's funny because although you think to yourself, well, if they were in the country, how are they keeping up with the fashions of the time? Well, there were magazines for women and newspapers, and like everyone today, you know, you, 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 you want to, to stay a little bit fashionable, and even if you're, you know, on the back 40 of Pickering Township, you're probably writing to your relatives back home and maybe relatives in Toronto, and they are probably letting you in on what the, what the latest fashions are. Hats. Because the hair was done up quite high in the 1830s on the top of the head, the hats had to have a very high crown to accommodate it. Now, this is a rather fancy number, and again, this might have been more, worn more by a lady in Toronto. This is a very nice hat, done with silk, and it has an ostrich feather and some, some ruching of the ribbon at the back. Um, a slightly plainer version is this one, although it is quite pretty with the, uh, with the ribbon ruching and the little bit of lace on it. Um, hats were a thing that most women of modest means might have only had one really good hat. And then what she would do is she would retrim it each season, uh, or as it got you know old looking, she would start to retrim it. Um, only the wealthy really had a lot of accessories. They would have had multiple hats, probably, you know, several dresses. If you were a country wife, you might have only had a best dress, which might have been your wedding gown originally, uh, and you might have had one or two work dresses, and that's about it. And you'd have to do laundry. Um, you know, to be able to, people did wear their dresses more frequently than we do because they would wash their underwear instead of washing the dress. And uh, so, you know, it was not such a problem. But that's a little bit of a look at the 1830s. Um, of course, this is not exhaustive. Um, we're just giving you a little sneak peek. So stay tuned for the next one. Dum, 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 dum. Ba, 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 ba,